changing out carpet and installing solid surface engineered hardwood. So welcome to Barely Homesteading. This week we want to talk about replacing some of our flooring and we have decided to replace the carpeted areas in the house uh, with solid surface before we completely move in. And so what we've decided to do in this area at least is go with an engineered hardwood. Now this is going to be a floating floor because this is a fairly small area. I've never done a floating floor before, so this is going to be a new experience for me. I have done uh, solid hardwood uh, previously and really liked how that turned out. But we're going to see how this floating engineered hardwood uh, works out for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to tear out this carpet, see how the uh, subfloor looks, and make sure that it is going to meet the requirements for this floating hardwood and then we will install the hardwood and see how it goes. All right, so we've got the carpet up, we've got the tack strips up. I've been over this a couple of times to get all the staples out from the uh, padding, from the carpet. Uh, we took the baseboards off and painted uh, to fix the imperfections from removal of the baseboards. And now we are ready to check the subfloor for low spots and high spots. So this particular flooring, the uh, subfloor has to be flat within 3 16ths of an inch over an 8 foot span. So uh, what you would normally do to check this is have a uh, long level or possibly an 8 foot long pipe if it's not very flexible. Um, I don't have access to either of those and so what I'm going to use instead is an 8 foot long piece of MDF <clears throat> board that I have. Uh, do not want to use wood, straight wood, because that's going to have bends and twists in it, but the MDF is pretty stable and so that's going to uh, be good enough for checking the subfloor. Uh, now, the checking of the gap, uh, you need to have less than 3 16ths of an inch gap. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a 3 16ths drill bit uh, as a feeler gauge underneath that eight foot long board in order to check that gap. All right, so the survey of the floor indicates that along this back wall, it rolls off quite a bit. And it looks like right here, where all of these subfloor panels come together is a bit of a high spot. So I'm going to set all these nails deeper and then come in with my high grit or my very low grit, low value uh, grit sandpaper, try to sand this ridge down and see if I can level that out. I also have a low spot over here, but it's an actual low spot. It's between two higher portions and so we're going to deal with that a little bit later.
Now that we have that ridge knocked down, we're going to fill in the low spots. Uh, there's two ways that uh, I've seen to do this. One is to get some floor leveler, some self-leveling <clears throat> compound. Uh, I'm not going to do that because this is, uh, there's a floor below us and I don't know when they put this subfloor in if they have any sort of uh, vapor barrier or anything below it. And so I don't want that compound dripping through the gaps and ending up uh, on the ceiling of the basement. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use uh, roofing felt, uh, asphalt paper. And we'll do that in layers to build up the low spots. So the floor is now flat, uh, less than 3 sixteenths of an inch over an 8 foot length. And we are now ready to put the underlayment for the flooring down. Now this underlayment is uh, free floating, it does not need to be stapled down, uh, and it is supposed to be cut back from all of the edges by one half to three quarters of an inch. So we're going to do that and then look at getting the flooring down. So we've got the underlayment installed and it's getting pretty late. So I think I'm going to call it a night and pick this up tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow, uh, but pick it up another day and start laying out the flooring. So one more thing that we have to do before we can start laying down the flooring is look for pinch points. This engineered flooring is a floating floor. And so it can't have anything that is restricting its movement anywhere around it. I've got this fireplace and the stone of the fireplace was undercut uh, to get flooring underneath it. And before I put down the underlayment, I made sure that there weren't any uh, pinch points. But now that we have the underlayment and uh, have leveled the floor in a couple of spots around here, we need to come back and verify that I don't have any pinch points. And so the easiest way to do that is just to take a piece of the flooring <clears throat> and you can see there the flooring goes under there and there's not really any pinch points. It's, there's a, it's snug but it would be able to move. As I come down that's also smooth, but right there, <clears throat> you can see it doesn't want to go in. Now I could force it, but that's not what we want to do. This needs to be free floating. And so there's a couple of spots where now that we've got the underlayment there, where it's just a little too tight. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come with the angle grinder I've got a masonry blade on here and I'm just going to knock off the bottom of these stones uh, to make sure that again that the uh, floor is free floating all the way around this uh, fireplace. Uh, now I don't want to damage either the underlayment or the flooring, the subfloor underneath this, so I'm going to pull the underlayment back and I've got a piece of sheet metal that I'm going to put down on top of the subfloor so that if the uh, blade was to kick a little bit or the, uh, the bottom of the angle grinder here, I don't want it tearing up the subfloor. All right, so I'm going to take a long board and make sure it fits. It 
It's a little snug right over here. I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem. All right, so I generated a lot of dust and debris with that. So I'm going to do a, another sweep and vacuum of this whole thing just to get up all that grit and then we can start laying down flooring. All right, so after sweeping and uh, cleaning this underlayment really well, we're ready to put in the flooring. Now, we don't want a strip of flooring to be less than two inches wide. And so when I measure this and account for the expansion gaps and the trim, the T-molding, I find that I would be uh, the last board, if I don't rip any of them, will be just over an inch wide. And so I've got to rip the first boards to shift that pattern down so that the last board is longer than, or wider than two inches. And so we're going to rip those first boards and then start the installation. Now I'm going to try to do this, if my calculations are right, I'm going to try to rip those first boards so that the boards right in front of the fireplace do not have to be ripped at all. With the flooring all installed, we're ready to start putting the trim pieces on. So I'm gonna start with the baseboards that were already installed that I've taken off. Um, I painted them last night uh, just to kind of clean up um, some of the damage that was done by taking them off and just uh, general spruce up. I'm gonna put those on first and then once those are on, we're gonna do the T-molding for where the uh, hardwood flooring mates up with tile. For the T-molding, I've already uh, laid it all out and looked at the coloring so that it matches as I go from T-molding to T-molding. Here, where these two pieces of T-molding uh, butt up to one another, uh, I could do a butt joint here, but I instead am going to do a bevel joint. So I'm going to come in, do a 45 degree bevel on both of these so that it overlaps and the joint is harder to see. So let's go do that. This T-molding is solid hickory, it is not engineered. And from what I've read, this is my first experience with hickory, so from what I've read, hickory can splinter quite a bit. And so you want to make sure that you've got sharp tools that you're working with uh, when you're dealing with hickory. And because of the splintering, uh, I'm actually going to tape the end to try to prevent as much of that splintering as I can. And so all that is is getting a piece of, uh, I typically use the blue painter's tape for this. And then putting that nice and firm 
right where you're going to do your cut. And that just provides a little more support for the grains of the wood so that it doesn't want to splinter and split. And you need to have your soft loaded. gave us a very nice clean cut no splintering I got a little bit down here on the bottom but you're not gonna see that been living with this flooring for about six months now and I am actually pleasantly surprised I really did not want to like this flooring because I was hoping it would get torn up really bad really quickly so that when we had to replace it I could say I tried engineered floating flooring didn't like it and I could go with a solid hardwood but it actually turns out this has worked out really well so while it is a floating floor it is not moving very much. Now, that could be partially because we've got some big couches on it, uh, and it's also on a very small area, but it really isn't moving like I was expecting it to. Now, there is a lot of vertical give to it, a lot more than you would have with a nail down, but that's to be expected, and it's really not as bad as I thought it would be. The floor has actually stood up quite well uh, to the traffic we have. So this area is where all of the kids kind of congregate in the afternoons and evenings after school and after dinner uh, to watch TV and to read and do things. So it gets a lot of traffic in here and there really is not any noticeable wear. So even in this high traffic area where we have no floor covering and it's the only way to get into this area so let's get, let's, it gets a lot of traffic uh, there is no visible wear or scratches or dents or anything. So this flooring is held up quite well. All right, so the verdict on the engineered hardwood, the floating flooring, is that it's worked out pretty well. We've liked it. It has not worn like I expected it to, and it's actually been a much more pleasant experience than I expected both with the installation and with the usage. So we would definitely go with it again in this area uh, if we needed to. So with that, this is uh, Lumberjack with Barely Homesteading, saying use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. See you next time. Please like and subscribe.